So uh, thanks very much, Richard. Thanks to uh, ACC. Uh, thanks to all of my friends and colleagues in Israel who have uh, welcomed me back with open arms, who have uh, given us the opportunity to present today on something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, Richard said a lot about me, or at least as much as he can know. Um, but I really want to talk about you. I want to talk about you, and I want to talk about your practice and what matters. You see, I did a lot of work with the special operations community, I've done a lot of international law, um, but I've also done a lot of cybersecurity work. I first got my start doing cybersecurity work in a courtroom, litigating on matters of, of consent and attribution um, in criminal law. But from there, I did move to the special operations community where I was literally only a lawyer. Um, but we did a lot of research, development, testing, and evaluation of new technologies. We had to find people and things and be able to create effects against those people and things. And what I found out very quickly was that it was very easy in the world of cybersecurity, data privacy, and, and the broader information environment to get lost in the ones and zeros, to become paralyzed by the complexity of cybersecurity or, or the technology that was being implemented. And as laws and regulations evolve, what I've seen is that many lawyers become equally paralyzed. They tend to be perplexed by the problem and at times simply admire the problem. I'm here to tell you you don't need to. I'm here to tell you that while cybersecurity in and of itself can be very technically complex, managing cybersecurity risk and managing compliance does not have to be, and it should not be. Managing, however, a PowerPoint pointer can be a trickier. So, so let me take you back. So let me take you back to an event when I was on the joint staff. So, so as Richard said, I, w I was a principal advisor for cybersecurity, technology, special operations, counterterrorism, intelligence on the joint staff. I advised the last two chairmen, Dempsey and Dunford. And in 2014, November of 2014, while sitting at the joint staff, we got a phone call. And the call said, hey, are you tracking this thing with Sony and North Korea? Well, at the joint staff, you look at the whole world. And you look at the problems, particularly the more significant problems, and you pay attention to these things. So the answer was, well, of course we are. And, and one of our subordinate commands said, well, I need to know four things. I need to know what happened, who did it, how do we know, and what can we do about it? Now, now, I'm a lawyer, so they frame most of these questions in, in a certain light. So, so what happened? The, the questions specifically were, was this an act of war? Was it a use of force or an armed attack? Was it something else? Was the principle of non-intervention violated? Right? This, to the second issue, who did it? And, and, and the third, how do we know? It went to the issue of, of attribution and thresholds for a potential response. Whether we could have a reasonable basis to respond under, under state responsibility or, or whether there was some requirement for us to have absolute certainty. But most significant to us, on the heels of 47,000 Sony employees' personal information being hacked, on the heels of three movies being released, on the heels of very, um, shall I say, sometimes inappropriate emails amongst Sony employees, including about some of their clients. And on the heels of threats that if the movie The Interview, which by the way, best I can tell, was an absolutely horrible movie, um, on threats that if that was released, released that there would actually be attacks in theaters in the United States. Right? The real question for us was what could we do about it? What could we do about it? Now, Again, when I went to the White House and, and we had these discussions amongst the interagency lawyers group, the question for me was, was largely something to, to talk about in, in largely legal terms, to talk about retorsion and pleas of necessity and self-defense and countermeasures and these sorts of things. But the real fundamental question was, what tangible actions can we take to have an impact in this space, in this complex world? What can we do about it? That's what I want to talk to you about today. So I want to talk about three things briefly. I want to talk about the threat landscape, the world that we're living in today. I want to talk about the question that I'm always asked. Why do I need a lawyer for cybersecurity? 
And then I want to talk about what I call creating cybersecurity momentum. Creating cybersecurity momentum. Because remember, I said it's very easy to be paralyzed by the complexities of cybersecurity, right? Think about what momentum is. It's mass times velocity. Mass times velocity. So if you are weighed down by the complexity of cybersecurity, if you're standing with the weight of the world on your shoulders and you can't move, you don't have any momentum. Because that mass is not multiplied by any vector of motion, any speed whatsoever. And sometimes, frankly, even if we are moving forward, we get hit by the forces, the, the, the corporate responsibility, the demands from our customers for convenience, agility, and, and, the, and the technical threats we face of security, and all the different states and non-state actors that, that impact our business, and our peers. It's easy to get actually pushed back and have that vector move you in the wrong direction. I want to talk to you about how you create momentum by taking some tangible steps forward. And as we begin, it's important to, to think through this as lawyers. Look, sometimes we get caught up in the rigidity of law. Law chases technology, but it never catches up, ever. It moves too slowly. I think lawyers sometimes think in this mindset. Think of concepts like Westphalian sovereignty and strict borders. Now, now in a place like Israel and, frankly, the United States, borders still matter. But they don't matter in the same way as they always have. Certainly not in the modern world. See, this is more of the world we live in today. A world that is, that is interconnected, where, where data flows. Our communications, our society, our culture are shaped by information and all that it does for us. Our systems, data, and network are at risk, and yet they provide such great opportunities. Individuals in many states care less about state autonomy than autonomous vehicles and automation and artificial intelligence. And yet it's up to us to look through the ones and zeros, to look at the technology and find those opportunities, and at the same time, to mitigate risk. So how do we do this in this very, very complex world? Well, one of the greatest challenges I face is derivative of this thing called Y2K. How many of you remember Y2K, right? End of the world. It's all going to stop. Nothing's going to work. Your refrigerator's going to stop working. Your computer's not going to work. All the photos you have of your children on the automatic frame, gone. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Except what happened in advance of nothing was a whole lot of people invested an awful lot of money in making sure stuff would continue, right? That we would be resilient, that things would work. So all this money was invested, and then it got to January 1st, midnight, and everybody blew into their party straws, and the ball dropped, and we just kept going on. So as a cybersecurity lawyer, one of the challenges I face is getting people to realize that 2017, it ain't Y2K. Not Y2K whatsoever. So in 2016, for example, there were 1,093 cyber attacks that were reported. Keep in mind, when something is reported, there are often an awful lot more of those events that have occurred. In the United States, 51% of adults suffered from some kind of cyber attack. So more than half of Americans. Now the global average cost for a single breach was $3.8 million, and what I like to explain to my clients in the United States is, in the U.S., that average jumps to $6.5 million. So it's expensive, right? Now what are some of, the, some of the issues we face? Well, we capture some of these specific threats in these categories. So, so disruption can be any number of things. It can be disruption of the financial transactions that you would have otherwise conducted. It could be the energy power not, not being received, the water system not functioning properly. Intrusion, it's the person that, or, or thing that finds its way in through a back door in your systems, networks, and, and, and potentially get access to your data. Collection might be gathering personal health information or, or financial information. And the exploitation might be then engaging in fraudulent transactions with that information or blackmailing your employees or customers. Destruction obviously can take a lot of different forms, it can be the centrifuges that spin, right? It can also be the encrypted data that you lose, 
that where your files are corrupted, and when you forgot to back up your systems, or didn't separate or segregate your systems in a meaningful sense so that they were better protected, you're in a bad position. Now, I'm going to quickly touch on three particularly important threats that we face today. And I'm just going to do this so that you can think forward a little bit instead of being so reactive. If there's nothing else you get from, from my talk today over the next 20 minutes, it's, it's be proactive. Think about where you need to be, not where you've been. So one of the places the world has been recently on the heels of the WannaCry attack it is, is stuck from ransomware. So we've been telling clients for a long time that you need to think about ransomware no longer as a point-to-point -point attack against a sin single individual or a computer. You need to think about distributed ransomware attacks, such that when I walk to this keyboard and I press a button, instead of just hitting my wife Erin, I hit everybody, right? And what did you see in WannaCry? You saw malware or, or a worm spread to six continents in half a day. Six continents, 300,000 users impacted. And, and admittedly, the actual ransom payments totaled only about $70,000. But the aggregate costs for responding to this, for, for hospitals, 20% being shut down in, in the UK, for ambulances being diverted, for, for medical procedures or systems being taken offline, for telecommunications companies being hit in Spain, for an automobile manufacturer being hit in France, for rail being impacted in Germany, for shipping being impacted in the United States, education in China and in India, and on and on. Aggregate cost in six days was $6 billion with a B. Six billion. So people didn't pay up, and they didn't get their files back, but, and, and by the way, from what I understand from the uh, FBI in the United States, even the individuals who did pay didn't get it back. Okay, so, it, so it's not a function of people were cheap and they didn't want to pay the $300, they didn't get it back. It's they weren't getting it back either way. And the aggregate cost was $6 billion. Another threat you need to be thinking about beyond ransomware, business email compromise. Now this slide depicts three different types of scenarios. One is where a cyber criminal is able to, to exploit a, a business email account and send an email directly to a customer such that the customer sends that individual money, right? That's a bad business model. Another is where a, a cyber criminal is able to exploit business email for the purpose of, of gathering personal information through the company itself, which, which feeds follow-on criminal activity. And the third example is where the cyber criminal is able to exploit that email for the purpose of getting the finance department within an institution to make a payment directly to them. And I will tell you, these aren't just theoretical examples. These are things that we are seeing happen time and again. And they happen sometimes because people are able to, so I work for McGuire Woods, Right? If someone sends an email from, to, from madams at mcguirewoods.com and they spell McGuire with a W instead of a U, you might fall for it if you're not paying attention. Although I won't ever send you that email, so don't send me any money. Okay? Don't fall for that one. But we've also seen instances where the techniques to actually take over an account have become more sophisticated such that people are literally sending from other people's accounts at times. Think about the range of problems that creates. Now, Again, I don't make this point to scare you. I make the point so that you can think about this, think about risk mitigation and response measures, which we'll talk about very shortly. And the third one I just want to hit, insider threats. Okay, so, so this is Edward Snowden, as one who worked for, for the US national security architecture. You can probably guess what I think of Edward Snowden, okay? But there are principally three types of, of insider threats that I like to talk about. One is the, is the employee of an organization who has access and because you don't have appropriate control measures is able to have a pretty significant impact if they engage in nefarious activity. The second is, is uh, let's say, the, the cleaning crew that has physical access to space because you haven't taken precautions there. Maybe they're underpaid and they're given a thumb drive and for, for 500 shekel they stick it in the, in, in the computer system and now that information can be exploited as well. Your system's disrupted. And the third kind is my father. It's my father. And by this, I mean my dad, who is, is a great patriotic American, who has a lot of great friends that he's, he's very close with, he likes to golf. And when he gets back from a round of golf, and, and invariably one of his friends will send him an email that he'd been telling him about. And it's some fantastic, you know, 
grouping of Americans all dressed up in red, white, and blue, the national anthem's playing, and they're in the shape of an American flag or a bald eagle or something ridiculous like that, right? And all he has to do to see this is click on the link. And he does it every time. No matter how many times I've told him not to click on the link, he clicks on the link. He clicks on the link. And what's funny is that so do your employees. Somewhere in the range of 20 to 40% of the time. There's a guy I work with that, that studies a lot of this information, and he, he's apologized to me because he said, look, with all the training we've done, I can only get him to stop clicking instead of 20% of the time down to 10%. Best I can do. Well, that's not great, but it also kind of cuts your risk in half in that space, right? So if you think about ways to get after the, the problem and train your employees in a better way, or if I could ever train my father, um, maybe we can make some progress. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about how we as, as lawyers can help make progress, right? So, you know, Richard, Richard mentions a, a particular mission that I was a participant in. The only reason I was a participant in that mission was because my clients knew I added value. They knew that I was willing to sit down, work on the tough problems, to get after it, and maybe not get to yes, but get to the effective solution. Right? To add value to the problem. What I'm here to tell you today is you can add value to cybersecurity. It's not all about information technology folks or information security folks or physical security folks. The legal and re regulatory landscape has been changing significantly and dramatically for a long time. In the United States, at the federal level, we started to see some of the biggest changes in 1996 and 1999 with the passage of, of, of HIPAA, or the Healthcare or Information uh, Portability uh, and Accountability Act, and then the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. So, so HIPAA deals with personal health information. It has certain security rules. It has notification rules and other pieces. GLBA, or Graham-Leach-Bliley, deals with financial institutions. And, and in 1996, HIPAA, and then 1999, GLBA, what they did was, was they said, okay, Enough. We're going to regulate this. We're, we're going to require you to explain to people how you're using their information, and we're going to require you to, to protect them. Now, over 21 and 18 years, respectively, um, there's been an evolution in thinking. It used to be that much of the focus, if not almost all of the focus, was on, was on privacy and data privacy. It was on personal health information, and it was on personal financial information. Um, but there were also provisions in these laws that talked about certain physical, technical, administrative safeguards, right, under, under GLBA in particular, which saw the safeguards rule produced in 2000, amended in 2005. And, and I think GLBA is particularly informative because what it said was, look, you have to tell your customers how you're going to share their information, but you also have an obligation to protect it. You have to institute physical, technical, and administrative safeguards to protect this stuff. Right? And, and we've seen in recent years a number of, of uh, settlements and fines come out um, from the Office of Civil Rights in the healthcare space and also from the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the financial institution space that have been significant. In February this year, the Office of Civil Rights because of the, the loss of personal health information, fined a company $5.5 million. That's the second time they'd had a $5.5 million fine. The SEC last June fined an investment fund $1 million. And they're both kind of for the same thing. Employees within the, uh, within the companies just didn't do enough to protect the information. And in one instance, actually, uh, it, while being a rogue actor, actually did it deliberately. So, so you see some problems. In the United States, you also see 48 different states with data privacy laws and competing schemes. You know, what constitutes personal information or personally identifiable information? What do you have to do in relation to that? Is health information included or, or, or not included? Does GLBA or does HIPAA exempt you from these other laws? You have all these competing schemes, right? And, and, and why do I emphasize this? I emphasize this because your IT folks or your information security folks they can't do this. They can't do this. In the United States, they have to call someone like me. Okay, they have to call someone like me or in-house counsel, ideally, 
who, who has a good sense of what the legal and regulatory landscape is. And when we talk outside the U.S., so, so many of my clients tend to think about their business as, as being U.S.-centric until we start to talk about data flow. And they say, oh, yeah, there's that EU thing. There's that EU thing, right? Pri what, what, privacy what? Privacy shield? Yeah. G G D GDPR? Yeah, GDPR. Privacy is a fundamental human right, right? The confidentiality of electronic communications is a fundamental human right. There's a sophistication of, of, of laws, regulation, and processes that we bring to bear that, frankly, you're not going to get in the tech space. Okay, so what's this? This is an example of the regulatory sphere in the United States. This is federal regulation of healthcare. All those different boxes represent someone who is providing oversight of whether or not businesses are complying in the United States. And this one, these are financial institutions, right? This, this is federal oversight and regulation of financial institutions. So you can see there, there's a morass of, of, of compliance uh, possibilities that we see developing. At the state level, we're starting to see some, some similar things. So this is a representation of uh, the New York Department of Financial Services, which in March of this year, uh, its cybersecurity uh, regulation came online. Um, and by August 28th of this year, so it has 16 different sections, but by August 28th of this year, there are certain things that have to come into effect. And I want to mention these in particular because they're very, very similar to an Israeli, obliga or Israeli obligations that we'll talk about in just a minute. So by August 28th of, of this year, there must be a cybersecurity program. There must be a cybersecurity policy and incident response plan. There must be a chief information security officer designated even if they're not actually part of the company. There must be continuous training of employees. There must be tangible measures implemented to limit access to data. There must be notice of cybersecurity events to, to the New York superintendent. And all these things reflect a continuing evolution of, of the legal and regulatory regime which is becoming more and more prescriptive. Now let's take briefly a look at Israeli cybersecurity compliance and, and some of the obligations here. And, and, and I, would, I would thank my colleagues from the National Cyber Directorate and also from SKR for, for helping to deepen my knowledge in this area and prepare some, some, of, some of my thoughts on this. You know, I, I think it's important that, that we understand you know, that under the basic law, right, Section 7, under the basic law for human dignity and, and liberty, we see this Israeli right to privacy specified, right? There's a, there's a small exception or maybe big, depending on one's perspective, under, under Section 8, but the right to privacy is, is codified in, in, a, in a significant way. Um, when you look to national law and regulations, of course, you're going to see that there are several laws on the books that deal not only with privacy and data privacy, but, but with cybersecurity, ranging from the computers law to the protection of privacy law to the encouragement for industrial research and development law and on and on. You see several re regulations in the space as well from the Israeli Privacy Protection Regulation from March of 2017 dealing with data protection to resolutions 2443 and 2444, more in the defense space. But if we look a little closer and we focus for just a moment on Israeli privacy protection, I think what we could say safely is, is it really focuses on three main areas, data collection, data protection, and, and data use. And, and while the Israeli privacy protection law in chapter one focuses generally on privacy and, and chapter two goes more specifically to, to databases, um, I really want to focus on the March 2017 data protection regulation. And, and I want to do this because it sets the data security policy for organizations that own, manage, or hold information. And information is defined pretty broadly. So I'm going to guess it has some application to most everyone in this room. So the regulation, the regulation itself, as of March of, of 2017, establishes a number of requirements. Now there's some flexibility to build it in over, over the next year, but, but think of these in light of what I talked about in New York, and think about the commonality. So the requirement for review of database information and associated risks, a requirement to set security procedures or protocols, to implement appropriate information security measures, to conduct risk surveys and periodic uh, security breach tests, 
and to document events that may cause damage to information or unauthorized access. So another reporting requirement. And, and the reporting of security breach events. And then again, like appointing the chief information security officer requirement to appoint a data security supervisor. So, so all these things go to the idea of there are compliance obligations, and as one of my colleagues back in the States like to say, compliance risk equals legal risk. So when we talk compliance, here's what we know again. So, so the threats have created substantial risks for you. Right? The standards, notification requirements, and regulatory frameworks exist, but they're continuing to evolve. In the United States in particular, regulatory penalties and civil judgments are increasing. And then your, your business valuations and, and profits are going to be shaped by this world. So how do we create some momentum in 9 minutes and 27 seconds or less? Well, one way is to stand around a boardroom and talk about it. Right? Stand around a boardroom and talk about it. Now, I, I think there's some benefit in this because it's very easy to get distracted in life and in our business routines by the day-to-day -day things that come up. We can have the grandest plans, but when you wake up in the morning and something else happens or diverts your attention, when you get a text message or an email, it's easy, it's easy to go and lose focus. That's why some of the things we're going to talk about are important because they help lay a roadmap for where you need to go. So when we talk about cybersecurity, for us as a law firm, we divide it into three categories. And the reason we do this is it makes it more manageable. So, so we talk first information assurance, which is largely what people tend to think about when they think about cybersecurity. It, it's protecting that information data and those networks. We talk about information governance, which is understanding where your data is, how it functions, but most importantly, it's managing it, managing it in a productive way. And then incident response and remediation, which is responding to these events that happen. It's A to Z from, from the time something bad happens and you get that call in the middle of the night until everything is resolved, even if it's a class action lawsuit. So, so let's take a little deeper dive here on the information assurance piece. So, so I said it's protecting the information. It's protecting against some of these threats that we've talked about. It's always important to emphasize that it really does matter. That it really does matter. Because at the end of the day, what do your customers care about? Do they care about whether you've complied with law or policy? Do they care whether you've, you've complied with uh, emerging industry standards, like in the United States, the National Institute for Standards and Technology or, or NIST standards? Probably not, right? They care whether they got the services you promised. They care whether their data was secured. They care whether they can conduct a financial transaction or whether their personal health information is being used against them. So we have specific things that we do about this. The first thing, the most important thing, is we have a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. Under the terms of the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, it'll be called a written information security program. But this is the threshold matter. This is where you organize your lines of business, your roles and responsibilities, and you say, how are we going to approach this problem? If you don't have one of these, you need one. It's very simple. This is, the, this is the first step, right, of not being paralyzed. Develop a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy, okay? Now, there are a bunch of other more specific things you can go to, right? We do a lot of work with vendor management oversight. We do help people think through these different standards and, and whether they're complying with it. If you have employees that bring their own devices to work, that maybe use their own laptops or phones, right, as many of you are probably doing right now, right? Do you have a policy that regulates the use? If not, why don't you? Why don't you? Because I'll tell you that the biggest risk in cybersecurity, aside from people, is, is whatever that outside element is that you bring into your business. Anytime you bring something in, you bring in another vulnerability. And you need to regulate how that's used from a business standpoint. We do M&A and PE due diligence. There was some discussion earlier about uh, due diligence and reps and warranties, and I'll, I'll highlight this in just a second. But forever... Lawyers have, have done due diligence. They've done reps and warranties. They've done pre- and post-deal covenants, right? How many of those that you've done have meaning, meaningful cybersecurity provisions in them? I'll tell you, when I showed up at my law firm and I looked back at, at a, a number of years' worth of these things, I didn't see a whole lot. I didn't see a whole lot. I saw an awful lot of deals done with maybe some vague mention of IT or, or intellectual property more frequently. Very, very little that offered any sophisticated analysis about what the risks were going into a deal or what the reps and warranties were from a cybersecurity or data transfer standpoint. Critical stuff to think through. 
uh, payment card industry standards, which we have in the U.S., something that obviously matters as you're engaging in, in transactions, and then employee education and training. I always emphasize three critical vulnerabilities in cybersecurity, hardware, software, and humans. And guess which one is by far the greatest vulnerability? Humans. No doubt. But there's something you can do about that. Okay, so just to show that this is not theoretical, we have a due diligence checklist for cybersecurity. Right? This is an excerpt from it. It's tailorable. But I have about four to six pages of, of due diligence considerations that will tailor to a deal. So if it, we need four line items or we need 400 line items, you can do it. But you have to do it because you have to think about it in advance of, of getting there. Once the deal starts, you know, well, unless you want to go outside. Uh, reps and warranties. Again, actual tailored cybersecurity reps and warranties, the kind of things you should be thinking about. We talk about information governance. Again, it's, it's managing your data, right? Here's the fundamental question. Are you in control of your data? Where it is, how it works, who you can share it with, under what circumstances? Do you know how many servers you have? Do your IT folks know how many servers you have? I have been shocked throughout my career at how many times I went to a particular entity and we started to look to map the data. And we said, well, where are your servers? And the answer was something other than precision, where they literally didn't know. In fact, I would say more times than not, in any major size business, folks don't know where all their servers are. It's just shocking to me. But it's a problem. And, and if you think about it from a business model standpoint, how can you ensure compliance if you don't know where stuff is? It's very simple. Aaron and I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I can't find anything, right? I can't find anything. It's kind of like that sometimes. So, what do, we, what do we do about this, right? What do we do about this? Well, the first thing you do is you institute an information and records management policy. It goes to these fundamental questions, right? It, it describes the type of data you generally have. It talks through your processes and, again, roles and responsibilities for what you're going to do about it. It's a critical thing to have, and every business that wants to function should have it. Vendor contracts, are you... Are you putting in specific, meaningful, precise cybersecurity provisions, or you kind of swagging it because you did a Google search and this is what it looks like somebody else did. Google's great, but now when you're doing this stuff. Uh, have you done the data inventory? Are you considering the data transfers? So, you know, we have this, these slides, these bullets, things for you to think through. My point here is every one of these bullets is a tangible thing you can do. You can't do them all at once, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you need to do all these things. This, this would be fantastic if you could. At least do the top red line. At least do the top red line. And then look at the other bullets and say, huh, should I have a privacy and social media policy? Are my employees' use of social media in advertising problematic for us under legal or regulatory regimes or just as a, as a matter of good business or not, right? Go through them, pick out the specific things, and continue to work on it. And then... Incident response and remediation. So this is responding to events, right? When people think about cybersecurity, I think a lot of times they think about information security folks on the front end, firewalls, software, not letting people get in, passwords, that kind of thing. And they think something breaks, how do we respond and how do we bring people together? There's some truth in that, but one of the messages I think I'm, I'm trying to convey is there's a whole lot of other stuff in between. And if you're going to do it right, you've got to get this other stuff right. Well, incident response remediation you know, obviously is really important, but, but look at this first line, right? What does it say? The worst time to make a decision is during a crisis. How, how many people in this room work for businesses? Don't actually raise your hands, because I don't want to embarrass anybody that doesn't raise their hand, okay? That has a, a, a meaningful incident response plan, right? A meaningful incident response plan. So, so what is this? This is where you map out the issues that you can consider in advance, right? Who's my crisis response team? What am I going to do with respect to public relations? Do I share intelligence? What's my law enforcement interaction? Do I bring in outside counsel? And then more specifically, what are some of the threats we face and what are we going to do about it? I'll talk you through that in more detail in a second, but I will tell you, if you don't have an incident response plan, you're in a bad place. You're in a bad place. And if you didn't, after wanna cry, look back and say, hey, this big thing just happened. It was really bad. And maybe it didn't hit us. That's good. We're pretty happy about that. If you didn't look back at your incident response plan and say, what would our incident response plan have had us do if WannaCry had hit us? And you got to go do that. You got to go do that right away. 
and, and if you haven't, why haven't you? Right? Anytime you see these big things happen, you got to go back, you got to look at it again, and you got to think through. There's an ecosystem that people talk about in, in, in computer science, right? The, the information environment or, 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 or the cyber domain is part of this ecosystem. Well, you're in it. You're in the ecosystem. And e you're either living and breathing and moving in it, or you're sitting there and everything else is moving around and doing stuff, and you got mold growing on you, and it's not good, right? So, so think through that, okay? There are a lot of other specific items here, you know, from a forensic investigation to internal investigations, regulatory investigations, um, all the way through litigation. Very specific things that we do and, and that you should be thinking about. You know, data breach response, a lot of key elements. There's certain ones that, again, you can think about in advance, right? You can think about the type of breach, the systems, the devices. Here are some examples that you see up here of some of the ways that we think through these problems and, and try to help our, our, our clients get out in front of it. But the, there, this isn't rocket science, right? These are the kinds of things that you can think about. Okay, what type of devices do I need to be concerned about? Well, servers and laptops and mobile devices and those sorts of things. There's investigation component. We talk about privilege in the U.S. There's certain circumstances where we can give privilege to our clients, and that's really, really important, all the way through the litigation stage. And then weave it all together. Figure out for you as a business. It doesn't have to be these three bins. It doesn't have to be information assurance, information governance, and incident response and remediation. But that's a pretty good starting point. I'll tell you, in my 25 years of experience in, in developing incident response plans and cybersecurity policies for the entirety of the U.S. government, this model works. Okay? It's, it's not perfect in the sense that you're always protected, but nothing is in the world of cybersecurity. But it goes an awful, awful long way. Most, most people that are in this space will tell you it's not about stopping everything. It's about identifying the things that you should already be stopping. And then from there, focusing the limited assets you have, the limited talent that, that you might be able to bring in, the limited resources and money you have on the more sophisticated threats. Reduce your risk and then focus on the harder problems. So again, how do you do this? Comprehensive cybersecurity strategy, information governance policy and supporting procedures, functional incident response plan, not something that sits in the shelf. Make it part of the ecosystem, train, train, train. Understand cybersecurity reputational risk. Remember, your customers care whether they get what you promised them, right? And focus on the human element. This is the best part of cybersecurity, right? If the, if the greatest vulnerability is people, that's good. We can do something about people, okay? Don't be this guy, right? Don't sit there paralyzed with the weight of the world on your shoulders. Take a step and another step. Look around, do some analysis, figure out what's next. Create some cybersecurity momentum. It's up to you. Thank you. Um, we didn't script this, and I don't know if you want to go into this. There's a tiny issue about hacking and cybersecurity in the United States with respect to elections, and there's a foreign country that seems to do that, perhaps in other countries. Is that ever going to be solved? So, so I don't think it'll ever be solved. I think if you look back throughout history, countries have, have historically... Um, wanted certain results in other states, right? There, there, there have always been forms of communication. Um, the, the, the cyber domain is, is, is nothing different in that respect. I think part of what's interesting in this influence context was the ability to reach across to grab more information than historically you could provide, right? And to potentially um, create an impact in, in another state, right? To, to arguably intrude upon the right of self-determination, an old international legal concept. Um, I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I think the, the, the ability to reach in is, is becoming more commonplace and, and defenses are always gonna be trying to catch up. Great, thank you. Any quick last minute question for Michael? Yes. Yeah, 
So I, so I don't think you're going to see the, the, the whole internet go down anytime soon. I think WannaCry is an interesting example because it really wasn't a particularly sophisticated form of, of ransomware. For example, the people that, that did it, they set up three Bitcoin vaults. Um, it was written in 27 languages, which helped it propagate, or, or to, to function in 27 languages, which helped it propagate across states. But I think what you're going to see are, are, are more significant uh, forms of ransomware. And, and I think business email compromise is the other one. Um, the, from the ransomware standpoint, you know, the, the, there was a vulnerability to the Windows operating system that was exploited, but there was also a backdoor payload called Eternal Blue. So while they patched this particular vulnerability, they didn't take care of the backdoor payload. So it's still out there. People are still figuring out ways to exploit it, and it could have some pretty significant impacts. Can everyone hear the question? The question was about blockchain. Yeah, and, and whether blockchain is an answer to this. So I, so I think it's funny because blockchain is part of what makes WannaCry an option, right? Blockchain is, is sort of the backdoor uh, systematic uh, division of, of transactions upon which Bitcoin technology operates, right? Um, but what we've seen is that uh, blockchain does provide some, some opportunities to separate um, separate information systems networks in a way that makes it harder to get to them. So, so I think, I don't know that it's the answer, but I think it's a tool in the tool belt and I think it's something that should be thought about very, very seriously. Another big hand from Michael Adams.